Now, I think aesthetics, as Dr. Mish pointed out, is a very unique thing that is unique to individuals. Cosmetic dentistry is a branch of dentistry that I feel doesn't exist in clinical practice or shouldn't do, where we are prescriptive to a very sort of dogmatic set of instructions. The instruction I had was to look at single teeth, but when you're in the aesthetic zone, i.e. where the patient smiles, and that just doesn't include the central incisors, the lateral incisors, first cuspids, uh, bicuspids, etc. It's the entire smile that we are looking at. So I've kind of changed it a little bit and gone into implants in the aesthetic zone. And that will include consecutive implant placements as well. So what are the key factors that we have to achieve ultimate aesthetics in implant dentistry? We need a stable bone volume and stable bone architecture. Dr. Hottle spoke to you about possibly the promise that white ceramic implants may have. But if we have a stable architecture of bone, why don't we think about going for slightly narrower implant, narrow diameter implants, in order to achieve the sort of stability that we're looking for long term? Also pointed out in his presentation was the correct three-dimensional positioning of an implant, and that is vitally important. We need adequate soft tissue, adequate soft tissue volume, so that we can form a biological seal around the implant abutment interface, which in essence is what's going to protect our work long term. Ideally, I would like to see a one-time or a very early abutment connection and never interfering with it. So in, in effect, changing our paradigms and our uh, philosophies of treatment, and rather than taking abutments on and off consistently, and harming the biologic width, or the pathologic width as it may be, uh, maintaining it. We need to look at the materials and the contours that we have of our transmucosal components, notably to go for narrower, more concave components, so that we're optimizing the amount of soft tissues that we have. We need to develop that soft tissue over time, provisional restoration, stabilization of the soft tissue. And we need to maintain it long term as well. And finally, maintenance of the restoration that we put in there. Now I tend to look at implants, and I'm having a little bit of feedback here I think, in the following categories where we have the immediate implants with extraction provisionalization hopefully that's fixed the problem we've got the immediate extraction immediate provisionalization which has been very popular on the podiums over the last four or five years but it's a very challenging um, approach to placing an implant we have the early placement at six weeks as uh, promoted by the ITI Strauman group of Danny Boozer where we're looking at placing the implant with a degree of guided bone regeneration. My approach is to take the 10 to 12 week delay, and I'll talk to you about my rationale for doing this. Then we have the delayed placement of 12 weeks plus, where potentially the patient is turning up with a tooth that's been missing for a considerable length of time. And then I see the distressed cases. Those cases that come in that require fixing, where it's gone completely wrong. And then, of course, we've got consecutive implants in the aesthetic zone. 80% of the cases that we see in clinical practice are single teeth. Replacement of single teeth predominantly in the smile zone. This is what I would call an aesthetic case where implants can restore harmony and soft tissue to a patient 85 years of age. This is what I would call contemporary European aesthetics. <laughs> where we deliver four implants on an 85-year-old patient. I placed these implants eight years ago. Now, if I was probably working in Southern California, 
I'd probably use an STD approach. Systematic tooth destruction is what I call it. Or venereal disease, where you do wall-to-wall ceramics and destroy a lot of tooth substance in order to create your standard 11, 12 millimeter tooth. Be careful when you create a smile, because you never really know who's going to fall in love with that smile. Look at the integration that we have of the white and the pink aesthetics. This is what we're trying to achieve. And when we look at the way that those implants can perform over a period of 8, 10, 15 years, we want to see implants for life, if that's a possibility. What we're observing is a beautiful harmony of the aesthetics, the soft tissue is being protected. Why is it being protected? Where's that protection coming from? Certain aesthetic goals and risk factors we have to consider. Form and function is important. This upper right central incisor required removal. We placed an implant, did some venereal disease on the adjacent teeth, and gave some really long contacts and destroyed the smile. Let's look at the hard and soft tissue aesthetics. Thin gingival biotypes, triangular shaped teeth, peaks of uh, soft tissue. Let's consider doing orthodontic extrusion to boost this gingival biotype where we can. Look at the interdental coal that we have in this space here, supported by the restoration. And if we look at the final restoration, we can actually see that maybe we've screwed up again, in that this restoration is slightly too short compared to the contralateral tooth. This is a case I usually like to show just before lunch. This patient's calculus bridge fractured, and a bunch of implants later gave her a degree of harmony and health that sort of gave her life back. And finally, a gorgeous young lady walks into the practice but can't smile. Two teeth are removed, two implants placed, some bonding, composite bonding, and it gave us that result. Did we meet her expectations? No, we exceeded those expectations. And by the way, Dr. Mish, I would love to come and work in your practice. All those beautiful women that you have to treat, it's amazing. <laughs> Can you imagine all that soft tissue work? <laughs> so if we look at the highest body of evidence that we actually have, and I work with a guy called Marco Esposito, or Esposito as you prefer to call him over here in the US. And Marco works essentially on Cochrane Library systematic reviews which means he takes randomized controlled clinical trials, takes the highest body of evidence that we have, and essentially does a meta-analysis of all the data and comes up with a conclusion. So what he did in this paper was we looked at placing implants into fresh extraction sockets. We had 30 randomized controlled clinical trials, of which we only included 22, with 976 participants. We looked at the various types of loading and the conclusions that we came up with were, in essence, yes, you can place an implant into an extraction socket with a degree of success, but that degree of success depends on a great deal of parameters and on the skill of the surgeon. The other systematic review we did was on the loading of these implants. And again, we're utilizing timing, we're looking at loading. The conclusion that we came up with on the loading was that, yes, again, we can load these implants. But there is a higher evidence of potential problems from doing this approach. So we owe this to uh, the guys at Team Atlanta, where we're looking at implant site classification. Now, the foolhardy amongst us might look at a type 1 and think, that is a slam dunk. This is going to get me a photograph on the cover of Forbes magazine, standing next to Oprah and the Queen, because I'm just going to produce the finest results ever. 
My opinion, type 4 is probably the easiest case we will deal with. From what Dr. Mish was saying, we're either looking at doing a implant retained overdenture or we're looking at extensive surgery of iliac crest grafting. Types 2 and type 3, we do realize that there is going to be some degree of augmentation that's required. And to some sort of comforting thought, you know that potentially you are going to have some degree of compromise on the outstanding result that you're looking for. Here you think, well, yes, I can preserve it so I can place the implant, and it's very simple. So when we're looking at decisions for placing implants, we've got to set ourselves limits and define the parameters of these limits. Look at the type of dehiscence or fenestration that we have. Look at the approach, whether it's simultaneous or staged, and what kind of technique we're going to adopt into it. How do we break this down into something that we can use in our clinical practice? And by the way, do remember that what happens in Vegas this weekend doesn't stay in Vegas. So you take some knowledge home, hopefully. Defects of up to two millimeters. We will always do a simultaneous placement with maybe some small amount of guided bone regeneration, not necessarily with a membrane. Defects of over two millimeters and up to four millimeters is always a simultaneous approach with a degree of guided bone regeneration plus or minus uh, a bone graft. The large defects, I always take a staged approach. If I look at ridge defects, buccolingual defects, and vertical defects, if that's my mother, tell her I'll be home later. Again, taking a staged approach. So, as we've seen from a lot of the cases earlier, implants can change people's lives. Now, this lady walked into my practice, and those eyes were enough to melt my heart. You look at the whole thing, and you think, this is a gorgeous, beautiful woman. There's a Bentley GTC in the parking lot. She's carrying a Hermes Birkin, Manolo Blahnix, you know that the pressure on your treatment is low because her expectations are unbelievably high. She walks in and smiles. What are our chances of having one of Carl Misch's high lip lines here? Or even a, slow, a low one? Nothing. How do we take a case from A to Z on this particular case? To produce something, again, that has a degree of harmony without being totally chiclet white. Is it perfect? No, it isn't perfect. But it is good, it is healthy, it is harmonious. And systemetry, which is not a total balance of tooth to tooth, is, is an important thing. We're not trying to make smiles symmetrical. These are the distressed cases that I have seen within the last six months. And each and every one of these distressed cases had one common denominator, and that was an immediate placement into a fresh extraction socket with provisionalization. The graying out, pink porcelain, God knows what this is. Some, a degree of um, metal forming, potential problems everywhere. Since we've been looking at these cases, we've introduced in the hospital at Manchester and in my practice a new aesthetic index where I take away the pink aesthetic index and the white aesthetic index because I assume that if it's a white aesthetic index you're looking at, you would have had the color of the tooth absolutely right. Otherwise, you wouldn't have fitted the crown. A GZI1, which is a gingival zenith index 1, shows the height of the soft tissue to be below where it should be on the contralateral tooth. A GZI2 gives us the height of the soft tissue in the same height as the contralateral tooth. GZI3 gives us a defect of up to two millimeters. And a GZI4 gives us a defect of four millimeters plus. Now, if we look at these cases, the soft tissue of the pink aesthetic index, or the PES, would work despite the fact that the crown looks totally lousy. So what are we looking at when we assess a smile? 
Well, with thanks to Urs Belser and Pascal Magna, we can look at the gingival health, assess the whole thing. As professionals, we are doing this as our patient walks into the clinic. Look at the interdental closure that's going on. Look at the long axis of the tooth. Classic example of a great smile. George Clooney has a class 2, division 2 smile. But that doesn't detract from the way that he looks. Look at the zenith of the gingival. Compare the balance of the gingival levels. Tom Cruise has completed a load of orthodontic treatment. His gingival balance is all over the place. Look at where the contact areas are. Do we have large contact areas or shorter contact areas? What is the soft tissue doing in that area? Then we look at a combination. The relative tooth form, which has been discussed quite extensively in the previous lecture. The basic features of the tooth. The characterization of the surface. We're looking at the surface texture and color. Look at the incisal edge configuration. And finally, look at the upper and lower smile line. There is no diktat that says there is a fixed rule for this lot to work. But when we look at a case like this and how it evolved from being a trauma case where we had a fracture, placing of the implant, simultaneous one-time one abutment connection through a final aesthetic result, which is seven years old at that kind of level, yes, it's a slightly longer restoration. Why? because the biologic width had formed from the fracture line of where that tooth had presented. So if we look at the radiographs of this over a period of seven years, then we can see why do we have such high level and such high expectation. Now let me explain to you what's going on here. This is the implant, that is the abutment. If you look at 2010, in this site here, between the implant and the abutment connection, we have bone covering this implant-abutment interface. So we are redefining the parameters these days of where we can measure biologic width from. Instead of measuring from the implant-abutment interface to the success criteria of the first thread of Saab and Abrahamson, we are looking at measuring from a prosthetic interface instead. Thanks to my good friend Ken Sorota for these images, you can see that certain systems are looking at ways of trying to encourage bone to stay in this particular site. And the critical zone is what happens in this soft tissue compartment or the inflammatory cell infiltrate, which is what we're looking at. And if you break this down, yes, we have a soft tissue margin, we have a prosthetic margin. We have an implant abutment interface and the bone level and this soft tissue compartment that falls within it. So how can we, at seven, ten years, get a result where we are placing an implant, making a subcrestal placement of this implant, making an abutment connection, filling this gap that we have around the abutment connection with an anorganic bovine bone, not interfering with this connection in any shape or form, and producing that kind of success rate. And I will show you CT scans of these later on to show that this is a three-dimensional concept, not a two-dimensional concept. So let's look at implant placement criteria. Take the gingival restorative interface, which is this kind of site. Now look at the symmetry what Dr. Mish was pointing out before, the shape of the incisors. These are totally different. You look at the lateral incisors, totally different. So let's break this down into what I would call the aesthetic triangle or the aesthetic triad. We have a tooth or an implant restoration which is supported by the bone. We have the soft tissue drape that goes over the bone. We also have the tooth supporting the soft tissue because if you take a tooth out, the interdental col completely disappears. Now, if we consider this to be a vacuum form, this round circle, that can be our prosthetic envelope, which should enclose the aesthetic triangle. Implant positioning 
must be within the prosthetic epicenter of all of this. If you take the prosthetic epicenter, place the implant too far to the facial, you will end up with a longer crown. Take it too far to the palatal, you have a ridge lap. Too far mesially and distally, you're encroaching onto the soft tissue. So break this down. Look at the long contacts. Wonderful. Really nice and easy to work with. Look at the attached mucosa. Thick gingival biotype. You know that this is a successful case that has been in the patient's mouth for a considerable length of time. So, let's look at the cases and the incidents that we have of what we would consider and what we see. Immediate extraction and provisionalization at the university and in practice, I would say forms less than 10% of the cases that we see. The eight to 10 week placement, as opposed to six weeks, forms about 80% of our work. And the delayed placement, probably 2%, the other cases making up the difference. So let's look at the immediate placements. Great work by Schropp, Botticelli, Arujo, looking at the socket and what happens to the socket. The running distance, the gap that there is there. What are we looking at is basically that the results are demonstrating that after a year of tooth extraction, there's an awful lot of changes going on in that facial plate. Schropp's work is telling us on the animal study that if you place an implant, you look at the buccal plate of bone, it will remodel. What we do know is that thin bone resorbs, thin soft tissue recedes. We look at all this stuff and it's all telling us the same thing about what happens in the extraction socket. Conclusions are that when you do this technique, you do it incredibly carefully because whatever you do with that buccal plate, you have to treat it in a very special way. We're going to look at this site. Take the tooth out. Look at the socket. Determine where the implant position needs to be. You very rarely see palatal uh, recession. Palatal bone is so thick, keratinized mucosa is attached, everything works beautifully. The facial bone is where the critical factors come into play. If we look at the technique of maybe doing our osteotomy going right down the center of the, implant, of the socket, this is incorrect because it will end up potentially with a fracture of that facial plate of bone. Okay, if we haven't lifted a flap, the mucoperiosteum will be intact, but that makes zero difference. This bone will resorb. So what is the technique that we should be looking at of placing an implant into a fresh extraction socket? Yes, we break it down into thirds. The old way of thinking about it was that we should be looking at maybe one third of the way up the palatal wall as being the point of where we actually start our osteotomy. If you follow this technique and use burrs, what you will realize is that the palatal plate of bone is very thick, dense bone. The facial plate of bone is very soft bone. And that soft bone will basically mean that your burr will move facially. If we look at the implant placement, utilizing that technique, then we can see that we are still ending up one third of the way up the socket as having a potential long-term problem. That is where the long axis of the um, osteotomy will be. If we look at the ideal position and look at the line that is created by that ideal position of the implant, then it starts a third of the way into the socket, not a third of the way up from the tip of the socket. That would give us the ideal positioning because unless you use something like a piezo surgery unit and you're utilizing drills, there is no way you'll keep the, this position in that direction. So if we look at how the osteotomy is prepared, a small round burr is placed in this, and that is the direction that we need to be working in. We look at the preparation of it. Initial burr will go in and then expand the osteotomy. Clinically, what do we see? There's the socket. Yes, it's intact. Another thing that we do on this is that we measure the buccal plate of bone, and we make sure that there is a certain minimum thickness with CBCT, that makes it easier. There's the pilot drill in position. Let's look at what happens. 
This is very thin, soft bone. That will disappear in a flash. Look at the preparation. This is utilizing a 2.8 millimeter burr. That's a 3.8 millimeter burr. The palatal extent doesn't move anywhere, but the facial extent continues to move right through the center of the implant to the facial of the implant to the facial plate of bone. So as night follows day, and most of us use burrs for the preparation of our osteotomies, this is what will happen. So if you're going to try and do this technique, be extremely careful. If we can advance, there we go. So what do we do with the running distance that's there? I always fill this gap up with an anorganic bovine bone. This does two things. It supports the buccal plate when it remodels and supports the soft tissue drape. This never resorbs. It is there as a filler. It is to do nothing other than act as a soft tissue support. Have in your mind a two-concept approach to placing an implant. The implant is supported primary stability within the host bone. The rest of it is supporting the soft tissue. It doesn't necessarily need to follow. At the University of Manchester, we did a case series where we looked at 364 patients. Only 32 were included in this technique. The follow-up was up to four years, and each one of those cases, 31, were in GZI 1 and 2. One fell into a 2 millimeter loss. The inclusion criteria was the absence of infection, an intact buccal wall that had one millimeter or more thickness, low aesthetic risk factors, and thick gingival biotypes. 